I appreciate that. It's good to have them tonight. And uh, I'm glad you're here. Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, and I trust you do, 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'll give you time to turn. We'll bring you up to speed where we're at. We've been preaching in the life of David. And uh, for I don't know how long now. I'd say pushing several months, Brother Marty, maybe. And just been a year. <laughs> Two? Two years? Oh, man. So we're at 1 Samuel 30, amen. <laughs> but uh, I love the Word of God, amen. Uh, Paul said uh, uh, precious, he talked about the preciousness of God, amen. The, uh, and uh, the Word of God is so precious, amen. There's so much in it you'll never exhaust it, amen. Uh, but we've been preaching in David's life and uh, we've been gleaning a whole lot. So I'm glad that uh, you're able to be here tonight. But I want to bring you up to speed just for a moment. Uh, David had gotten under a, a, a sense of fear from Saul's repeated ta attacks. And David had made his mind up. He said, there's nothing better for me than that I should perish by the hand of Saul. And so David made his mind up that he is just going to end up dying. Saul was going to kill him one day. And he got discouraged and he got defeated. And in the midst of that time, God had sent the prophet Gad to go to him and tell him not to leave Jerusalem. Do you recall that? David didn't obey. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He didn't do what God told him, and so David fell in sin. Well, in the midst of falling in sin, uh, sometimes we think we know more than God does. And friend, let me tell you something. The Lord's way out past you, amen. He's way out past us and, and what we know, what we're capable of doing. And God is always on time in my life. Well, David had taken his eyes off the Lord, and in the midst of doing it, he thought he would protect himself. And so after disobeying God, his heart and his mind strays, and he flees to Achash, the king of the Philistines. Uh, got a message on going to Achash with the sword of Goliath. How foolish we are sometimes when we step out of God's will. So he went down to Achash, and while there, he was protected from Saul. Amen. He was protected from Saul. It wasn't God's way. God wanted to do exceeding abundantly above all that David could ever ask or think. He wanted David in the run and continually protect him, but David's ways seemed better than God's ways. So he flees to the king of Achash, goes down there, seeks protection, and he gets what he's after. He is protected by Saul through Achash. Literally, Israel's number one enemy was protecting the future king from the heartache and the adversity that God was allowing to come in his life. While there, while there at Achash, David uh, grew in provisions. Just because you're out of God's will doesn't mean that you can't financially prosper or you can't grow in provision. David gained much provision while, at, uh, while in Philistia. He gained houses, children, wives, uh, cattle. I mean, there's so much that was gained. And then in the midst when David least expected it, God through his sovereign hand is now going to chasten his servant. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And if you be without chastisement, you bastards and not son. That's not a bad word, young people. That just means you don't have a father. And what he's saying there is if God's not chastening you, when you're out of his will, he's not your father. Well, while there, God's going to chasten David. David is... Enjoying life, he's enjoying the things that he's accumulated. Sometimes things can get us. It's okay not to have 
th- it's okay to have things, but when things have you, there's a problem. Amen? And they begin to get a hold of David. And so while he was there, God allowed him to, he, he went off a little ways. And when he did, David left his wives and his children and all that he had uh, in a place called Ziklag. Now, Achash gave Ziklag to David. Now, uh, what a sad, sad statement. I'll be here all night trying to give you the depth of that meaning. Uh, But it was given to David and to his family, and so David accepted the gift from the enemy of God. Amen? And when he did, he didn't realize what he was accepting. Well, the Lord's looking... And sometimes you and I think that we can do, uh, go against God's will and not pay the consequences. Well, let me tell you something. God knows how to chasten His people. I am persuaded through Scripture that the burning of Ziklag is the chastening hand of Almighty God upon David because David was instructed by the Lord not to leave Israel. He said, I want you to stay here. David didn't listen, he got his eyes off God, and he fled to the enemy for protection, uh, undermining God that God was not capable of protecting David. So God allowed Ziklag to be burned with fire. Do you recall that? 1 Samuel 30, 1 Samuel 27, uh, the heartache comes. Well, David comes and he sees that his wives are taken captive, his children are gone, Everything he has is burned to the ground. And the Bible says that David and the men wept until they could weep no more. They was broken. There was sorrow. And he finally realized that he had had the ephod and he had a biophar. They had the way to God. They had the chain of prayer to God. And David had a, if you will, a direct line to the Lord but he didn't use it. Oh my, I could park there a couple days, but I won't. Uh, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus said men ought to always pray and faint not. Uh, David had forgotten about speaking and communing with God. So he pulls the ephod out and he goes to Abiathar and in reverence he goes to Almighty God about his situation, which he ought to have done before, but he didn't do it. Well, after doing that, God said, I want you to get up and I want you to pursue the enemy. At this particular time, David had no idea who had burned Ziklag. He didn't have a clue. Well, in the midst of pursuing God's will, God causes an Egyptian to fall sick. We've talked about this over a few weeks. This Egyptian fell sick and was in the path of David, uh, uh, of David's way to pursue after the enemy. Now, how did he fall sick right then? The world would tell you, what luck? You better get that filth out of your mind. Uh, the world calls it luck. You and I call it providence. Amen. God had caused this Egyptian to fall sick right in the path of David. Well, while pursuing him, he comes to this Egyptian. And uh, this Egyptian was a slave of an Amalekite. You recall that. He was a slave. And David comes to him. And this uh, uh, Egyptian begins to spill all the beans. He begins to tell everything that happened. David didn't know what had happened. But it was almost like God had used this Egyptian to literally record everything and tell his servant. David was nowhere around. All David knew was God had promised David that he was going to recover all. He was going to gain everything back. No one was going to die. And when David heard that, he just started pursuing the enemy and obeying God. And when he did, listen, providence fell in his path. The providence of God fell right in this path. Here this Egyptian is. He goes to him. He says, who are you? He said, look. He said, I'm the slave and my master's an Amalekite. 
And they burn Ziglag. And so David is in communication with this man. And this man tells David everything he needs to know. God had this slave of this Amalekite there to with the ears and the eyes to take in and record and be able to tell David every move he needed to make, every place he needed to go to, to recover all. Now when God says, you're going to recover all, you're going to recover all, friend. God said he would. And so this Egyptian tells him, and then all of a sudden you see David pursuing. We talked a week ago about the assisting of providence and how God assists you and I through the providence of the Lord and how he takes care of us. He meets our needs. He does for us daily what we cannot do. Amen? Well, after this, David goes and David is carrying on a conversation. He's, he's talking to this fellow. He says, you know where this company is? And that Egyptian, he talks back to David. He says, I know right where he's at. I know right where they're at. But look, you got to promise me you won't kill me. you got to promise me that you won't turn me over to my master. And David said, take me to him. And David and his men begin to follow the path of God. I want to show you something here. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. First of all, he realizes the assisting hand of God by providence. Now when David follows this Egyptian who leads him right to the camp of the Amalekite. You there? In your mind, they're coming to the camp of the Amalekites. I want to preach tonight on the advantage given to David. There's an advantage here. Something's going to give David great advantage. He gets to the campsite of the Amalekites and the Bible says, listen, the Word of God paints a picture of how the Amalekites, listen to me, cannot unstrain their, their passions. They've let their flesh get the best of them, friend. They are indulging in the flesh. If you look in the text in verse 15 and 16, of 1 Samuel 30, you'll find out that when David got there with his men, that he, the enemy he was to pursue had been drinking and dancing and partying it up and living a life of hell, and they had been indulging in the flesh. The text is literally teaching this. The advantage that was given to David to slaughter the Amalekites was because the Amalekites had no control over their flesh. They weren't able to control their flesh, and they had been indulging in the food and the wine and the women. I mean, it's all in the text. Just look at it. They were literally, they did not know how to restrain their flesh. Basically, when David and his men got there, do you know what he saw? A bunch of men and women laid out drunk that had been partying all night. Look in the text. It's there. What an advantage. I thought we were going to war. And you know what happens? When the flesh has done all it can do, it sets you up vulnerable for the enemy. David and his men pulled their swords. Look at the scriptures. It's there. I'm paraphrasing, but it's there. And there was a slaughter all night long. All they had to do, look, there was no, there was very minimum resistance, if any at all. Because basically these men were so drunk, they couldn't fight for themselves. They had indulged in the flesh to the point to where they were out of their minds. And when they least expected it, they gave, listen to me. I'm going to say something here, and, and, and if you don't miss it, if you don't get nothing, get this. They gave great advantage to the enemy because of indulging in the flesh. It's in the text. There was a slaughter all night long. I'm telling you, David and his men, they killed every one of them. The Bible said there's only some that got away that were on Campbell's. And the only reason they got away is they wasn't drinking and driving. Amen. 
Somebody was on the camel staying straight. And he couldn't get drunk and drive that camel, so he said, I better stay on the camel. He made a wise choice. Hey, man, saved his life not to indulge in the flesh. Well, I want you to see a few things tonight in this thing called flesh. Turn your Bible, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know the text. You know where I'm going. We're living in a day, friend, to where it's okay to indulge in the flesh. Drink all you want. Eat all you want. Sleep around all you want. Do what you want. It don't matter. Hey, look, you don't make nobody mad. Hey, it's sad to say, and if they cut me off this thing, they can cut me off. It's sad to say you can live a homosexual lifestyle. You can live in an ungodly way and everybody will accept it. But you go to preaching the Word of God and trying to live in a life of total submission and Christianity and you'll wake hell up, friend. It's okay to live any way you want. But you mark her down. You get serious with God. and You come to to God in prayer and dedicate your life to prayer and turn away from all the wickedness, friend. You'll stir hell up. You will. 2 Timothy, let me read that text to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4, verse 4. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, Paul said. Hey, look. Uh, out there, it's okay to live any way you want, do whatever you want. Just don't open that Bible around me. Just don't try to correct me in the way I'm living. I'm minding my own business. Leave me alone. You go to church, live any way you want, but you know what people don't understand? There's coming a reckoning day. There's coming a day, friend, God's going to settle all this stuff. There's coming a day that God said, we're going to answer for how we live down here. And if we die without Christ, there's a place where the worm dies not and the fires never quench. And child of God, may I remind you, we're going to answer for how we live. Paul said, yea, knowing the terror of the Lord, speaking and referring to the bema seat of Christ. Hey, look. You better be careful about indulging in the flesh. You better be careful, and I better be careful about this thing called pleasure. Now listen, the Scriptures also say on the flip side that we're to love life. It's okay to enjoy life. Amen. It's all right to have a good time every now and then, as long as it's not in defiance to the Word of God. But that's not what he's talking about. I'm telling you, these men had indulged in the flesh, And when they least expected it, the enemy walked on the scene and there was a slaughter all night long. Now listen, there's two flips, two sides of that coin. Number one, if the Amalekites would have learned how to restrain their flesh and not indulge in the flesh, friend, many of them would have been able to stay alive and maybe even uh, uh, get away and not die in such situations. But I don't want to focus on them. I want to focus on the other side. I want to focus on David and his men. Do you know why the enemy took such a great blow that night? You know why the enemy? I know God was in control. First of all, you've got the providence of God, God assisting David. Uh, and you might, hey, GPS ain't nothing, buddy. God knew right where they were, and God used this Egyptian to take them right to them. They didn't have to worry about coming in the back way or the front way. God led them right there. You know why? Because God had already saw that the enemy would give David a great advantage by the way they were living. Now, I've said all that to say this. There's a flip side to this coin. There's a spiritual side. How many times do you and I give our enemy, the devil, walking about seeking whom he may devour, we give him great advantage when we indulge in the flesh? I didn't say you did. I said we do. 
I'm telling you, no wonder Paul comes along and says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Live for Jesus, young people. Mark it off. Do right, Dr. Bob Gray. I can hear him now wailing and weeping. Do right, do right, do right. Till the stars fall. Do right. Just do right. Don't indulge in the flesh. Well, you look at the Amalekites, and they were defeated and slaughtered. I'm telling you, all the wives, all the children. Uh, I mean, you're talking about great sorrow and heartache coming to the Amalekites, friend. It came. Why? Because those older the dads and the moms, young people, I don't know any other way to say it. I'm not going to water it down. I'm just going to give it the way it is. They living like hell, sucking on the bottle, living like hell, sleeping around, doing anything they wanted to do. They were scattered abroad. They were laying around drunk. And the enemy came on the field. You better thank God to the high heavens if you've got parents that love God and lead you in the right way. I didn't have that. You better do it. How many young children, I wonder, how many young ladies were taken off just like what's going on in the nation of Israel right now today and abused because they didn't have no mama or no daddy with no more sense to love them. And real love will lead you the right way. Your parents may make you mad and because they tell you what's right, but they do it because they love you. It's one thing for your parent to tell you something. Hey, let me tell you, this, this saying come right out of the pits of hell. You ready? Do what I say, not what I do. That came right out of hell. Them Amalekite parents, they couldn't say nothing. You know all they were doing? They were weeping and wailing if any of them were alive because the young women had been killed and slaughtered and abused. All because daddy wanted to turn a bottle up. Or mom. Why? Listen, well, there ain't nothing wrong with a little bit of wine Jesus made. Well, you better study your Bible. Jesus didn't create no wine, friend. Jesus created the fruit of the vine, the grape juice. Amen. Listen to the word of God. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. God says you're a fool to drink alcohol. Not these Amalekites. They had done God all. Uh, they had done gained a lot of provision. They had already taken over the land. They had already seized David's wives and his children. They had done burn everything down. God said, okay, let me tell you something, old friend. Uh, there's coming a day when God decides to do something. Now watch it. I don't know if any of you have ever played chess. Anybody play chess? I'm no good at it. But I like it. God's the best chess player there ever been. He'll have you in checkmate before you can even breathe. Here these Amalekites are. God's going to use them to chase David. And these Amalekites, listen. You ever heard somebody say something like this? Well, I'm not hurting nobody. I'm just doing what I want to do. I'm not bothering nobody. Just leave me alone. I'm not hurting nobody. Well, these Amalekites had that idea. We ain't bothering nobody. Man, we're drinking. We're living it up, doing whatever we want to. You know what? One of the worst things that can happen to a person is when God steps back and lets them do what they want to do. When God says, okay, you stubborn thing, you're not going to listen to me. You're not going to obey Remember what God told, Samuel told Nathan, the, uh, Nathan told David, rather, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. We get caught in a mess, we get, we get caught up doing something wrong, and we want to give people, pacify them, give them gifts. Uh, young children want to do everything just to make it all right. God said, no, uh -uh. it's better to obey than to sacrifice. It's good that you want to do that. You want to make amends, but y'all just obeyed. 
is what the message was to David. Him and his men get there and the Amalekites, listen, they've given great advantage to the enemy because of the way they live. They've indulged in the flesh. But the slaughter wouldn't have been for Israel if there wouldn't have been something there. Unlike the Amalekites, you see the men of mighty valor, David's men. I can hear the New Testament call along something along this line. Come out from among yourselves and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Let me tell you something. There would have never been such a great a slaughter on the Amalekite people had not David and his men been devoted to Christ. Great devotion to the Lord. They wasn't, they wasn't in the wrong place. They wasn't doing the wrong thing. David had made mistakes, but he had got down here without ephod. He said, God, I need your help. I've lost everything I've got. My ways, Lord, are against your ways. Surely they're not your ways. And you gave me my will. and uh, Your ways better than mine. Now I don't have a house to live in. They've got my wife and children. God, what do I do? God said, get up off your face, basically. Pursue the enemy. Watch it. Thou shalt overtake. You ready? And recover all. He said, anything you've lost, I believe this is the message here. Anything you've lost, you listening to me? has been self-inflicted. You've, you've done this yourself. Y'all not getting it, are you? Let me illustrate it. You're not getting it. Time is like a vapor. Time passes so fast. I can remember Erlanger Hospital, 30, 37, 36, 38. She's around there somewhere. I was walking through Erlanger Hospital with that baby. I was proud of her. Man, she's about my, she might be a little, she, she, she's about as tall as me now. And I look and I see her in church, her family in church. Bless God, I've done a lot wrong, but I did. I may have done something right there. It's almost scary sometimes, you know. <laughs> loves me, loves her mama. What a blessing. Loves her husband. In obedience, serves her husband. I'm just giving you the book, man. You can, you can argue about it all you want. Takes care of her children. Never blows my phone up. We can't do this. We can't buy this. We can't keep a job. We can't, none of that, none of that drama. Stable. I said self-inflicted wounds. Sometimes we, we have self-inflicted wounds in life. David's looking down and he's learning. He's He's realizing the ziklag and all the heartache and the sorrow that has come from the place being burned and his wife and his children being captive because he had neglected prayer. He had neglected God's will. And may I say this before I close. If a man after God's own heart can do that, there's not a person in this building that's not capable of that. Self-inflicted wounds. Let's hit the fast forward button. They don't have that no more. I, my wife says they don't use videos no more. It's all CDs now. But let's say some of these kids don't even know what a video is, man. Let's say we do. Let's fast forward in David's life. Time has gone by and sin has taken its course. And he's got a favorite son whom he loves immensely by the name of Absalom. From the sole of his feet to the crown of his head, he was beautiful. He was David's favorite. And Absalom had abused his, uh, Absalom had killed his brother Amnon for abusing his sister. 
Sin, sin, sin. And David didn't handle it right. Self-inflicted wounds. And one day the king realizes that his own son has risen up in rebellion, rebellion against him. You'll never know, you hope you never know that kind of pain. David's own boy wanted to kill him. He seeks, he goes to Ahithophel and seeks counsel how to kill David. And Ahithophel says, you know your father, he's like a mama bear and her cubs, buddy. He's in some hole somewhere, you're not going to find him. He goes on to say, let me just take these men and go upon him and kill him. And while David is weak-handed, I'll kill him. Listen to the scriptures. And the Bible said in the saying, pleased Absalom. He wanted his daddy dead. Time passes. But God. Paul said, God's up there. Son wanting to kill the father. God sends out his men. I'll never forget old Lester Rolar preaching on the day God hung the hippie. <laughs> David's on the castle and here comes a high mass. He's a good man. See, we don't have young people, they didn't have cell phones back in. There wasn't no texting. Mom, I'm on the way. Or David, they're on the way. They had what they were called runners. They would find out what was going on and they would run and tell the king the news. And David looks out over the city and he says, who is that running? He said, that's the son of a high mass. He's a good man. He said, maybe he'll have good tidings. And what David was asking was what was the news about Absalom. Civil war had broken out. And Absalom, they were coming to kill Absalom because he wanted his daddy dead. And the boy gets up there, the young runner gets up there, catches his breath, and David says these words. He said, is the young man Absalom safe? The boy caught his breath and he looks up at, it, at David and he said, may all the king's enemies be as that young man. He's dead. He was hung in an oak. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said go. he was hung in an oak by his hair, hanging, dangling between heaven and hell as he wasn't fit for either one. David goes over and he starts the, the long, self-inflicted heartache. He's bowed over the king's the, the, the walls of the palace. And he's weeping and crying and he says these words, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. Would to God I had died for thee. My boy's in hell. It's my fault. Spurgeon made this statement. He said this is about the time the reality of the Holy Spirit takes over. And whisper something along this line in the life, in the ear of David. It's thy sin that's caused this evil. Self inflicted wounds. That happened after this. In this incident, David is so dedicated to Christ that him and his men slaughter the enemy all night long. Something transpired between that moment and this moment, and I'll tell you what it is. It's called dedication. When did his problem start? In the time when kings were to be at war. You know what David was doing? He was indulging in the flesh. Looking out over that palace wall and saw that young lady. And before you know it, he took a young lady, ruined her life by the name of Bathsheba. Had an illegitimate, had a child with her. 
God took the child. The Bible, you can argue it all you want. The scripture said, and God struck the child. God trying to get his attention. And finally, he realizes the pain from self inflicted wounds. And here, he goes in. And thank the Lord, he'd been dedicated. Young people, may I tell you, you'll never go wrong in being dedicated to Christ. Live for God. Live for God. Love the Lord with all thine heart and all thy soul. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Live for the Lord. Bank on it. Etch it down in stone. And don't be a victim of self-inflicted wounds. Thank the Lord. David's men knew how to keep the uh, strain under the flesh. The Amalekites were slaughtered because they didn't know how to restrain their flesh. My, 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 look here. We better realize something, friend. We're capable of doing anything. May I remind you before you leave tonight, Christ died for you. He saved you. And the Spirit of God come into your heart and He lives forever and He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But may I remind you, He didn't take your own nature away. It's still there. And we better learn to tame that old nature and to keep it in submission. And let me tell you how do I do that, preacher. You better stay in this book. Stay in this book. I've hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I love him today. Stand with me if you would. Stand with me if you would. I'll go ahead. You had that cue, didn't you? While no one's looking. Well, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Here again. Can't agree with this fellow, but this song he wrote, God's used in my life. And uh, I think it's fitting for the hour. Maybe you need to come. Another day of life was spent And as I wondered where it went I watched the sands of time slip fast away as It's all right. You come on. Don't worry about nobody else. Had I really done for Christ I lost so many hours I can't reclaim And as I bowed my head In deep despair And cried out to the Lord in prayer I heard a still small voice Whisper this refrain Redeem the time For soon it will be gone Time for life is not so long. Don't let the moment spent down here become a tale of wasted years. Remember that your days are like a passing glance. You only get one chance to redeem the time. Be here and gone before you know it. As the days of life go quickly by, the seconds pass, the moments fly. What are we really We're gonna do it now? To the Lord. Our years are like a passing wind. 
Thank you, Brother Marty. Just before we dismiss in a word of prayer, I'll say something like that. I didn't even have this thought. You follow that fella's life, and I know I'm, if I'm on Facebook, they'll just have to let the chips fall where they are. You follow that fella's life that's singing, and the very thing I preach tonight is his problem. Isn't that amazing how God can use somebody one day and they can yield and get away from the Lord and indulge in the flesh. And before you know it, it'll ruin your life. I'm so grateful that the Lord reminds you and I of how good he is to us and what we need to do to stay close to him. Boy, I tell you, we just stay, do right, do right. Amen. It's been good to be in God's house. Brother Chuck, why don't you dismiss us? Wednesday night and just have them your willing way and each